Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. You'll all have been ready to go to God's Word. This is part two of a two-part series I'm doing under the title, Prodigals Come Home. I love the graphic Christy picked out for this week, some guy living out of of a car. That car has seen better days. Um, But you know that it really probably would be a modern depiction of when a prodigal leaves and they go out and they live in a far country and then they hit hard times. They can end up homeless. Here's why I'm preaching this message. Here's why I preached last week. And if you weren't here last week, of course, it's online. It is, I believe, the Holy Spirit's desire for faith to rise in your heart and in my heart that we will begin to believe once again or even more passionately that our prodigals will come home. That our prodigals will come home. I'm going to give you a little background of how I came to preach on this subject. Um, Nathaniel introduced the song, The Father's House, several months back. And one day when we were singing that song, I'm sitting over here where I almost always sit, and the bridge part of the song came on, which says, prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the father's in the room. That just got in my heart. Prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. When God's Spirit is moving, prodigals come home. Now, I am using the term prodigal the way the church folks use it. That's someone who's away from the family of God, someone who's away from church. We want them back. We want them back connected to Jesus. We want them back connected to the local church. So that had been stirring in my heart. Prodigals come home. Prodigals come home. Last May... We were having prayer here at the church. I pray with some pastors in the community, and we actually host the prayer time. Well, the past couple of times, we've actually been praying here in the sanctuary. We used to pray in one of the classrooms, but I just felt that I wanted to move to the sanctuary. And so we're praying, and the reason the pastors get together is to pray for our communities, to pray for Columbus, to pray for Bartholomew County, to pray for the surrounding counties where these pastors have churches. There's a couple from Hope, there's several here from Columbus, and we pray for Columbus. So we're here in the sanctuary, and a friend of mine, Pastor Dennis, I'm I'm praying, and and you know, some of us when we pray, um, you know, we're we're kind of the, the Pentecostal charismatic. Um, there's some people that pray like this. I don't know if you're going to get this on camera or not. I mean, they're, they're very, um, this is, there's nothing wrong with praying like this, you know. But then there's some of us, this is how we pray. <laughs> you know, we walk and we pray and we walk and we pray. Well, Pastor Dennis is one of those kind of guys. But he wasn't walking and praying down on the floor where the rest of us are praying. He comes up here on our platform. So, okay, I mean, he pray on our platform. And he starts pacing the platform and praying. He starts pacing the platform and praying. We're praying for the community, praying out loud. Sometimes somebody is leading. Sometimes we're just all praying. And he's pacing the platform. And he's pacing the platform. And Pastor Dennis, we, had a, we have a little bit of a lull. And he says, God is just talking to me right now. I thought, wow, that's really cool. Talking to him about what God wants to do in Columbus, what God wants to do in Bartholomew County. God's just really talking to him. And then he started talking about me and this church. He's talking about me. And I'm thinking, we're praying for the community. This is why we came. Not, not about me. Let's, but he started talking about me and about what God was doing in the church. What he's doing is he's getting a word from the Lord. It's a prophetic word. And I don't have time. Actually, I built a whole introduction to this message about 10 minutes long about what a prophetic word is. I just don't have time to explain it. So uh, you're just going to have to look it up yourself or wait till another time when I preach on prophecy. Here's what he starts talking about. He starts talking about what God is going to do, wants to do, and is already starting to do here at Columbus First Assembly. What God has prepared us as a church to do and to be. And the thing about it was that there was not much that he said. In fact, I'm not certain that there was anything that he said in this prophetic word 
that God hadn't already showed me personally. Now, he said it in a different way. He used different words, but the concept of what God wanted to do, I'd already had it in my heart. And so I'm thinking, wow, this is really cool. Again, I'm a bit embarrassed because there's four or five other pastors here praying. And what are, they, what, what are we praying for? We're praying for Pastor Rick. We're praying for Columbus First Assembly. But hey, if God wants to talk and God wants to do things. And so one of the things that he said, this is, this is why this started to stir. One of the things he said God wanted to do through our church. Now, I don't say he's not going to do it through other churches, but that he wants to do through here. He said, you know what? God is calling the prodigals home here at Columbus First Assembly. Prodigals are coming home. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. We just started singing that song like four weeks ago. And that was stirring in my heart. Prodigals come home. I thought, Lord, you just... You're just speaking and confirming. And then, that happened in May, in June. District Council happened in May for uh, the assemblies, and I was unable to go. Finally, a month later, they posted the services on the district's website. It was a month late, and one day I just decided to click into Pastor Scott Wilson's ministry. And about five to ten minutes in, all of a sudden, he stops and he shares a story of a prodigal that returned home, his own son. And we watched the video of that last week. So here it is. The song started to stir in my heart. Then we get a prophetic word that now is confirming what's stirring in my heart. Now I hear a story. And this man is saying, the prodigals are coming home. And I thought... This is God speaking to me. It takes three times maybe. No, honestly, folks, I, it, it may sound a little bit silly. When God is giving prophetic direction, you need confirmation. Because there's some people, including myself, who have jumped off the deep end. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. I don't know if I have enough time. But if I don't, Jack can wait and the kids can wait. Let me tell you. Okay. I thought I had a prophetic word years ago. Okay? Never confirmed by anybody else. I had, um, I had heard a, a, a tape, those the cassette tapes. Anybody remember what those look like, those little white things? Um, <laughs> Betsy, you're nodding, and the young people are just, what? A Never mind. I was listening to a cassette tape of a man who God had healed his eyes. And then, after God had healed his eyes, there was a healing move of God that started to happen in his church. He had faith to believe for his folks to get healed. And so people's eyes were being healed. And it was so cool. And I'm listening to this, and, and my faith is rising. And I thought God told me he was going to heal my eyes. I said, go for it, Lord. And so um, I also felt that he told me to not wear my glasses anymore. I said, okay. Uh, but I, I compromised on that. I decided to at least wear them to drive because I have significant nearsightedness. In a normal situation, I can see clearly from here to here. I can see blurry from there, and then you guys, you're out of focus. Since my eye surgeries, I can actually tell who you guys are. But I took my glasses off. <laughs> Word from God. Took my glasses off. Got to work. I was working in a bank at that time, working with checks and working with deposit tickets and things. And so I'm looking at them right here. And people say, oh, did you get contacts? Did you get contacts? No, I didn't get contacts. Oh, you're not wearing your glasses. What's up? Well, God's going to heal me. Oh, really? Okay, cool. So I've taken my glasses off in faith. God's going to heal me. Week went by, nothing changed. One Friday, <laughs> and I remember it was a Friday because my supervisor had a date. One Friday, we didn't balance. Our department needed to balance, and they're looking, and they're looking, and they're looking, and they're looking, and they're looking through everybody's transactions, and we're not balanced, and we're not balanced, and guess whose pile of work they found it in? The guy who hadn't been wearing his glasses for a week because his eyes were being healed. And guess whose supervisor had a few choice words to say to the guy whose eyes are supposed to be healed because they missed or were very late for their date. But it, it wasn't a confirmation. I believe that God wanted to touch my eyes. I still believe that God can and would 
like to touch my eyes. You say, well, you just had your glasses off. Because of some surgeries, I can see quite well here, but I can't see up close any longer, uh, so I have bifocals. But share that, I share that story with you just to give some direction because sometimes somebody will speak into your life or you'll hear something and you think that it's God. Sometimes the best thing to do is to sit and wait for confirmation. And that's what happened. I had the stirring in my heart with the song. Then I had the stirring in my heart with the prophetic word that came, which was a confirmation. But then the third confirmation came in that video. And I believe that God is speaking to Columbus First Assembly that he's calling the prodigals home. So since prodigals are going to be returning to Jesus and returning to this church, what does God expect us to do? First thing I think he expects us to make this a place that is expecting prodigals, will receive prodigals, and will embrace the prodigal. And I believe that God is desiring to have all of us who have prodigal children or friends, people that were once in the church that are now gone, you cry out for these prodigals or cry out again for them. Pray even more for them. We're going to read the text that this term prodigal or prodigal son comes from. Luke chapter 15, if you turn there in your Bibles. We're not going to read all of chapter 15. In fact, we're not even going to read all of the parable. We're going to re re read some select verses. It says on the screen, 11 through 32, I'm going to stop at 24 this morning. This is now not called the parable of the prodigal son any longer because the word prodigal dictionary means wasteful. But the church has now taken this term prodigal, and it means someone who's away from God. I don't have any problem. That's how I'm using the term. But in the Bibles now, it's usually called the parable of the lost son. That's the heading that is given in my Bible. Let's read. To illustrate the point further, the point of how God feels about lost people, that's what Jesus is speaking about, Jesus told them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, I want my share of the estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days later, this younger son packed up all of his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all of his money on wild living. About the, about the time that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home and say to my father, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf. We have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost and now he is found. So the party began. As I said I'm using the word prodigal in these messages in the popular church use of the word as those who are away from the family of faith. Here's my definition for what a prodigal is coming up on the screen. If you grabbed a note sheet, it's at the top of your note sheet. A prodigal knows the truth and has chosen to turn from that truth. They have chosen to leave the father's house and the family, the family meaning the church. They have chosen to do that. Now, not all unsaved individuals are prodigals. Prodigals know the truth. They have been instructed. They have been around. They have learned what it is to be in the Father's house. But for whatever reason, they have chosen to turn from that truth. 
and they are now doing life on their own. There's two general uh, types of prodigals. We talked about these in detail last week. I'm not going to talk about them uh, in detail, but I'm going to bring them up. Two general types of prodigals. One I call the deep in sin prodigal. This is the one that are going to live their life. They've been in the father's house. They know the truth, but they have now gone out. They're deep in sin. Uh, they're enjoying their life. They love the parties. They love the sex. They love the substances. They love the people they hang around and all the stuff that they're into. They like living without the rules. They like living with outside of what they have learned God expects of them. The son in the story was this type. He was what I call a deep in sin prodigal. Now, some people, again, that's a continuum and say, well, I'm, no, I'm nowhere near deep in sin. Sure, I sin, but those people are deep in sin. It doesn't matter. You're living life on your own. You're living life outside of the family of God, outside of the commands of God. You're living life. You know the truth, and you are choosing not to. You're a prodigal. Maybe you're watching today, and you're a prodigal, and you're just wondering, what does God expect of me? Or... Will God receive me back? Well, the story has great good news about what God will do. But that's the first kind of prodigal. The second kind of prodigal is this. Is the I'm okay without God or Jesus or with just a little of God and Jesus prodigal? Now, that's a long description, but it describes it very well. These are individuals that aren't deep in sin. They're good people. They're good people. They're not into heavy drugs or parties or sex. I mean, they keep a relatively moral life, but... They once follow God and no longer do. God doesn't have much of an influence in their life anymore, if any influence of their life. Those are the ones that are okay without God or Jesus. And then a subcategory of those that they hang around church and they have the Bible and they hang around spiritual things just enough so that their conscience doesn't bother them. But they really don't want much to do with God. They don't want much to do with the things of God. They're this type of prodigal, the I'm okay without God or Jesus or with just a little of God or Jesus prodigal. Personally, I believe this type of prodigal is oftentimes easy, more difficult to reach than the one who knows they're deep in sin. Because their life is good. They just don't need God. All right. So that's in review. Now, changing just a little bit, I took a poll, and I'm going to just ask for a show of hands. How many of you have ever watched a movie more than once or a television show more than once? Would you raise your hand? Okay. All right. Very good. I took a poll of some select individuals. Pastor Evan, he is a Lord of the Rings fan. So I took a poll and I said, Pastor Evan, how many times have you watched the Lord of the Rings? Now you have to understand, the Lord of the Rings is a trilogy. There's three movies. Each one is approximately three hours. He says, mm, well, um, at least ten times, but probably more. He said, he, he was saying, I probably would have watched it more, but it, it's kind of a real investment of my time because they're so long. So Pastor Evan is a 10 plus on the Lord of the Rings. So then I polled myself because I'm very easy to poll. And some of you know that um, Star Wars is one of my favorites. Back in 19, I believe, 77, when the first Star Wars came out, it used to just be called Star Wars. It wasn't Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. It was just called Star Wars. I saw it in the theater. I saw it in another theater. I saw it in a different theater. I saw it at the drive-in. You know, we had drive-ins back then. They're not around so much anymore. Okay, so how many times for Star Wars for me? More than 20. I really have lost count. But then I went to someone else who's... Taste in movies does not gravitate towards the sci-fi or the fantasy. His taste in movies is towards the Western, specifically John Wayne Westerns. So I called John Wampler, who I knew loved John Wayne movies, and I asked him, John, how many times have you seen your favorite John Wayne movies? And he said, oh, El Dorado. Oh, El Dorado. Oh, gosh, at least 20 or more than 20 times. Oh, and then, then he goes, and when the Cowboys. The co oh, at least 20 times of the Cowboys. Then he started ticking off some others. I had enough information, so I had to, you know, sort of shut him down a bit. <laughs> but then he goes on to say, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about him, i got to watch him again. <laughs> okay. Where am I going? Here's where I'm going. 
It's good sometimes to see things more than once, both for enjoyment purposes and because you're going to get something else out of it. So I decided, originally I was only going to show you that video last week of Pastor um, uh, Scott Wilson. But I thought, you know what? If he can watch El Dorado 20 plus times, if I can watch Star Wars 20 plus times, if you can watch Lord of the Rings, all three of them, 10 plus times, we can watch Pastor Scott Wilson's testimony twice. So pay attention to the screens. All right, this isn't in my note. This isn't, I'm going to tell you something right now. This is something the Lord's prompted me to tell you right now. Uh, you know how you just had the word about sons and daughters coming back that are prodigals? How many of you in here right now, you, have, you raised your hand for people to pray for you because you've got a son, daughter, grandchild, something like that, you're praying to come back to Jesus. Let me see your hand. I'm going to talk to you for a second. My dad, I look at it now as he was stacking wood. Because there was a moment where I surrendered myself and I told God at 17, I'm in. I'll do whatever you want. And I was kind of halfway in, halfway out. And he said, I want to know if you're all the way in. I said, I'm all the way in. And when the fire hit in my life, guess what? There was wood already stacked. And there was content for it to keep going. So what I'm telling you is the Sundays you had them in church, the Sundays you had them in youth, this Wednesday night you had them in youth, it was not for nothing. You did not labor in vain. It is stacked wood and God's going to bring the fire and it was not for nothing. Now let me tell you. Six years ago, my youngest son, Dakota, came to me and walked into my room and he said, I need to talk to you because I'm about to graduate high school and I need you to know where I'm at. My 17-year-old comes in and he says, Mom and Dad, I love you. I'm not against you. You haven't done anything wrong. This is nothing personal, but I don't believe in God. And I feel responsible to not only uh, have that as personal, but everybody kind of lumps me in with y'all and your beliefs. And so I think it's pretty important on social media that I would let everyone know where I stand because that's important to me. So he began to go on social media and just share his thoughts and his opinions and his different views, hurting my heart. Let me tell you something. You're talking about every single night for the next probably four weeks. I was every night, every morning, all day going, okay, God, what are you talking about? I've, you know, I've done missionary kids retreats, PK retreats. I, I mean, like what everything I do is not just about youth ministry and doing this, but my whole life has been about PKs and MKs and my own son's gonna go to hell? It can't be, I can't handle it. I cannot function, I can't think, I can't preach, I can't live, I can't, I can't do it, I just can't move on. And I started talking to God and I said, God, you got to tell me, you are the God who knows the end from the beginning. And so you got to help me here in the middle. You, if you'll tell me how it ends, if you'll just tell me he's going to heaven, I can make it in the middle with all of his drugs. I can make it in the middle with all the perversion. Because right now I know I love that kid so much that if you don't tell me he's going to heaven in the end, I'm gonna be screwing things up all in the middle. You know how many times, mom and dad, you screw things up because you're calling them saying, are you still doing the drugs? You smoking today? You understand you're never gonna hold down a job? You're gonna to go to prison. You ain't gonna have no wife. They're gonna leave you. You're gonna get divorced. And you talk things out of your fear that's really distancing them not only from you, but from the Lord. Wow, I just begin to pray. And as I prayed and sought the Lord, I said, God, you just gotta tell me, listen, four weeks, four weeks in, one morning, God told me this, what he told me, be confident. I said, what does that mean? Guess what happened? Two verses, my dad had me memorized, came up. Be confident in this, that what I began in Dakota, I will carry on to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. Then 1 John 5, John, are you listening to me? Come on, you've been there. You've seen the code. You know the code. 1 John 5, 14 saying, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, will he not give to us what we ask for? And the Lord told me, walk in confidence. And so I went and told my wife, I said, Jenny, God told me this morning, Dakota's going to heaven. We don't have to worry about it. We know the end so we can make it in the middle. 
She said, how do you know? I said, God just spoke to me. I'm telling you right now. He told me to be confident. And let me tell you something. For six years, I've been walking that. I'm talking six years right now, right now. I don't have resolve, but it is resolved. Come on, is anybody in here understand what I'm talking about? He's told me where it ends, and I don't have resolve until just six weeks ago on Easter Sunday. I was driving to church on Saturday, and God put in my heart to call Dakota, tell him that my friend's church is five minutes from him where he lives about an hour away, and tell him he may want to go because they got a night service this time, and I know you don't get up early. He said, well, maybe I'll go. I said, well, if you go, go tell him. I said, hi. An hour and a half later, he texted me and said, I'm here. Should I say hi to Pastor Toby? I said, absolutely. You know what? This is a church of 5,000 people. And when he went up there, told the security guard, my dad's got one of you too, so don't tackle me. Just tell him I I need to talk to him. (laughs) Isn't that funny that he said that? My dad's got one of you too. (laughs) Pastor Toby came over. Listen to me. Listen to me, pastors. Listen to me, people of God. And Toby walked over and said, you're Scott Wilson's boy. Come here, son. My, my son has long, long hair, like down like this, okay? He smells like weed. Every bit of clothing he has is weed. You know that guy that's coming into your church three weeks ago with the long hippie hair and the jacked out clothes and it smells like weed and you smell marijuana coming all over the place and you're going, oh my God, that's my son. That, that is my son I have been pouring my guts out praying for. And Toby put his arms around him and says, come backstage. And brought him backstage as if he was the greatest man of God here, like he's Billy Graham. He brings him backstage and introduces him to every staff and says, this guy right here, this guy's got greatness on. I know his dad. His daddy's told me all about it. This guy's awesome. He needs to be on our worship team. So he calls me the next day, says, I went, said hi to Toby, but I'm feeling sick. I can't come over for Easter dinner. I said, okay, it's all right. I'm going to go to uh, Lufkin tomorrow. I got meetings. We'll just talk when you get back. I'd love to hear what's going on. Okay, dad. Okay, dad. Tuesday, I come home. He's waiting in my house. <laughs> and he, he's already called me the day before. And mom, he'd come home because he had to go to the doctor because he's thinking he's having panic attacks. Because guess what he said? He went back home from being at church with Toby and that the Lord spoke. He said two things I've been asking. I don't believe in God because of this and this. He spoke on in that service. And so I went back to my house by myself and I sat there and I said, I've never felt you before. But if you're real, let me feel you like my mom and my dad. And he said, Dad, I started crying so hard I couldn't stop crying. He said, I cried for three days. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. All I did is cry. So he said, I got, I got weird things. So he said, I got to go to the doctor. He went to the doctor, but on Tuesdays in the back. And this is where I sat. Scott, I sat on the back. You know you've been praying with me on this. We're sitting on the back porch. He's bawling, crying. He can't stop. I'm not talking this. I'm talking about heaving. And I said, let me tell you something, son, right now. God says he loves you. He says, why? He says he loves you while you were yet a sinner. In Christ, every verse my dad was teaching me was coming out of my heart to my son. Come on, I'm talking about generations. I'm talking about stacking wood. I'm talking about it ain't for nothing. And as I'm sitting there and I'm saying, God says, I want you to know, he says you're in this family. I want you to say it out loud right now. He says, what do you want me to say? I said, I want you to say, I know, I know. He's trying. I said, say it again. I know, I know. I fit in God's family. I know I fit in this family. I am loved. I am valued. I am gifted. I am powerful. I am saved. I am righteous. Oh, man. Then we started binding the devil and rebuke said, I bind the lie of the enemy that I'm bound up in sin and can never be set free. I rebuke the lies of the enemy that I'm a drug addict and will never change. I rebuke the lie of the enemy that I'll never be any good or be good enough. Come on. He just began to cry and cry and cry until four hours later. Later he goes, you want to get something to eat? (laughs) 
Come on! Yes! It's coming! It's coming! It's coming! It's coming! He's going to do it! He's going to do it! Come on. He hadn't been to church in six years, and we're driving up on Sunday. He gets up early, is already dressed downstairs. This is the boy that a week before was going to bed at 4.30 in the morning, getting up in the afternoon at 4.30. He was up 7.30. Let's go. We're driving in the car, and I said, uh-oh, had an idea. I said, son, everybody in this church, young and old, has been praying for you every day for six years and I can't control the crazies <laughs> there are going to be some old ladies come tackle you they're going to kiss on you there are going to be people all over just so excited that they even see you walk in the building so I just want you to know be prepared somebody might come up and go oh my god please tell me you're saved they'll do something like this and you look, listen no I look at listen to this he looked at me and he says, tell him, come tell me. I want to thank him for praying for me. Tell him, put the robe on me, the ring on my finger, sandals on the feet. The prodigal is coming home. Are you kidding me? It's amazing. He says it's coming. Can you believe it? For us. Can you believe it for us? It's coming. Can you believe that we're going to have stories here? Maybe it's your prodigal. Maybe it's someone else's prodigal. Maybe it's someone else who lives on another coast, but their child or their uh, brother or their sister or a grandchild is living here, and the Spirit of God begins to move, and they come to Columbus First Assembly. Can we believe it's coming? Can you believe with me? Thank you. I was just trying to get a little interaction. I believe it's coming. There's not a person here or at home, I don't believe, unless you're a very special individual who doesn't have a prodigal. Someone who grew up knowing and has left. So I said, if this is what God wants, what do we need to do? So here we go. In your notes. First two we are from last week. I'm just going to review them, and then we're going to move into new material. Number one, what do we do? We pray. Pray for your prodigals. Cry out to God for each of them. Call their names to God. Just don't pray to the generally unsaved. Oh, God, save my unsaved family members. No, pray for Brandon. God, save Brandon. God, save Claire. God, save. Put the name in there. Cry out to God and call their names. Number two. Like the father in the story, expectantly wait for them to head home. Be looking for them to come home. And this is not easy, especially if you've waited a long time. But the father in the story was this type of man. He was expecting. That's why he saw his son a long way off. I think every day he would look down the road. Every time he was on the road, he knew he went this direction. He was looking for the boy to come back. He just believed that he was going to come back. Now remember, this is, this is a, a picture of God the father. God the father is believing for your prodigal too. That they're going to come back. Be that type of person. All right, here we go. Number three. This is new material for this week. Be careful how you relate to them while they're prodigals. Be careful how you relate to them while they're prodigals. You love them, certainly. But until they are ready, you will probably have very little impact on their life when you talk to them about faith and Jesus. And you may actually be working against what you're praying for. In the story, he talked about being in the middle. And he says, we can screw things up in the middle. Here's a quote from Pastor Scott Wilson. It's in your notes coming up on the screen. Mom and dad, do you know how many times you screw things up? You talk things out of your fear that's really distancing them, your prodigal, not only from you, but from the Lord. Parents, grandparents, siblings... 
whoever you're praying for that's a prodigal, be careful at this middle season because you can actually be working against what God is trying to do by what you say because you can be speaking out of fear. And let's just face it. If you have a prodigal, if you have someone who's been around and known the things of God and they're away from God, you are fearful. There are prodigals in my family. This morning, I called their names to God. But if they were to die today, I have no assurance that they're going to be in heaven. That is fear producing. We had some folks at the altar here um, this last week that were, that, were, that were crying out for their prodigals. And I, I looked at some of the faces, and Nathaniel Diener and I were talking on Wednesday. And he said, do you know such and such has been praying for like 40 years? 40 years! It's hard to pray for 40 years and to be still expectantly waiting. But that means in that 40-year period of time, you got to be careful how you relate. Now, it doesn't mean you deny your faith. That doesn't mean you don't talk about your faith. But you got to be careful you don't push it on them. Number four, and this one's a little bit tougher because I've seen, even I failed on this one. Let God take them to the bottom. Let God take your prodigal to the bottom. Verse 17 in the story says, when he finally came to his senses. The boy was in the far country feeding pigs. He, he was starving. And when he finally came to his senses, when he finally, you know, sometimes it looks like they're coming to their senses. I have watched parents and I have watched siblings Bail people out when God was trying to get them to the bottom. This boy, he had no great spiritual revelation. The Bible didn't say he had a great spiritual revelation. An angel didn't appear to him. Uh, he didn't start attending services at the local synagogue. He just came to his senses and said, hey, it's better for the slaves in my father's house than it is for me here in this far country. And he started to head home. Sometimes... We've got to let them come to do their senses. I think a good prayer for all of us to pray would be, God, bring, and then put the name of your prodigal, bring Claire, bring Ben, bring David, whoever it might be. Bring them to their senses. And then be very careful. Get out of the way. Because it may mean that God has to take them to the bottom. Because some people, the only time that they will finally Look up to God and begin to move towards him is when they're at the bottom. If you are bailing your prodigal out financially or in other ways, time after time after time after time, and then after you bail them out, they go back, it's time to stop. Because you may be working against the hand of God. He may be trying to get them to that place where they will come to their senses. So let God take them to the bottom. Number five. Oh, wait a minute. I have another statement here. There it is. This is an important statement. I don't want to miss it. Will you love your prodigal enough and trust God enough to let them get to the bottom? Will you love? You know, it, it takes a lot of love to let a prodigal get to the bottom. Will you love your prodigal enough and trust God enough to let them get to the bottom. Remember, God loves them. In fact, Pastor Evan already said that. I thought he's going to be pre preaching my message during prayer because he talked about how much God loves everyone, specifically the prodigals that are away. God loves them more than we do. We've got to be able to trust them into God's hands, even if it means their life is falling apart. He said, well, I can see the devil in their life. Sometimes God allows the devil to do his work to get them to the point where they look up. It says when the prodigal finally came to his senses. That means there may have been times where he kind of came to his senses. But when he finally came to his senses, he went home. If this is you, and I know I'm talking to some people today because the Holy Spirit has really wanted me to, to spend a little extra time on this. If this is you today, you have a, such a difficult time because your prodigal is constantly 
going down and then you kind of save them or you help them. You need great wisdom because sometimes it is right to help. Sometimes it is right. Sometimes. But you need great wisdom to know when you see a child or a friend or other family member hurting as to when to really help. And do understand this. You may not want to admit this about your child or your brother, sister, mom, dad. Some of them are expert manipulators. You need great wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And you need great courage. Because when you say no, if you've never said no before, do you know the kind of fit they're going to throw and the way they're going to try to manipulate you because you've said yes and yes and yes and yes and yes? That first time that you say no and hold the line, that's going to be tough. And you're going to go to bed and you're not going to be able to sleep and you're going to go to bed crying out to God and you're going to go to bed thinking you've really blown it and these, they've made you feel guilty and they've made you feel... <laughs> Uh, shameful of what you've done. Use great wisdom, but there comes a point where you have to not rescue them. Because we need them to, as the prodigal did, finally come to their senses. It has to be their decision. All right, number five. Pray until they are saved and transformed or you go to be with the Lord. Pray until they are saved and transformed, or you go to be with the Lord. Because after many years of praying, many of us just throw up our hands, say, I guess they're not coming to the Lord, or I'm so tired of praying, or I can't believe for them anymore. I don't know what to do. I want to encourage you, if that's you, you've been praying for a long time. If you're at home today and you've been praying for a long time, start praying again. Pray more fervently again. Keep on praying I'll tell you a story of a man by the name of George Mueller. Uh, back in the 1800s, he was well known in England. He founded an orphanage by the name of the Ashley Downs Orphanage in Bristol, England. And he was a man of great prayer and faith. He wrote extensively on prayer. Uh, his books on prayer are still uh, read by many. I have some in my library, um, and I have read uh, not only uh, some of his books on prayer, I've read his life story. But here is here is um, a story that I want to share with you. In November of 1844, Mrs. Mueller writing this, and it's been um, retained by his, his organization. They have a website now. In November of 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, whether I was on land or on sea, and whatever my pre the pressure of my engagement might be, 18 months elapsed before the first of the five was converted. I thanked God and prayed on for the others. Five more years elapsed, and the second was converted. I thanked God for the second. And six years passed before the third was converted. I thanked God for the three and went on praying for the other two, and these two remained unconverted. 36 years later, Mueller wrote this about those two. They were sons of one of Mueller's friends. They were still not converted, and he wrote, but I hope in God, I pray on, and look for the answer. They are unconverted yet, but they will be. In 1897, 52 years after he began to pray daily without interruption for these two men, they were finally converted. But it was after he had already died. That's why I made it this way. Pray until they're saved and transformed, until you go on to be with the Lord. Do you know that if you go to be with the Lord and some of those you've been praying for passionately are not yet converted, that doesn't mean that your prayers still haven't made a difference? I heard years ago, uh, someone make this statement. Prayers are timeless. Prayers are timeless. You pray them now, you go to the Lord tomorrow, but that prayer you prayed now, it doesn't mean that prayer is still not effective. 
four years, three years, five years. Uh, I did a little bit more research on these two men in this story, and it was about three or four months after Mueller's death that has been reported. That's when they were finally converted. He prayed for 52 years. He died, but it was a few months later they were finally converted. Oh, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, brothers and sisters, maybe children praying for parents, pray, pray, pray. That first point that I made, pray. Call out their names to God. Cry out to God for them. Pray. Pray. Pray until they are saved and transformed or until you go to be with the Lord. One final point. Number six. And this is just a challenge. Is the way you follow Jesus something your prodigal wants? Is the way you follow Jesus something your prodigal wants? In that story, when Dakota was convicted, he prayed, and he prayed about never having felt God. But this is what he said. God, if you are real, let me feel you like my mom and my dad. And the Spirit of God hit him. Would your prodigal say, God, I want to feel you like my mom and my dad? Would they pray that? Or would they pray, God, I want to know you like my mom and my dad? I've watched, and their lives are so much better, so much more peaceful. They seem to be ha able to handle anything that life throws at them. God, I want to know you like my mom and my dad or my grandma or my grandpa or my brother or my sister. Would they, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> would they pray that way? Would they pray that way? This is a concern that I have for some of us. It's when our prodigals look at us, they don't see anything they're worth getting. Worth coming home for. That's not true of all. I know some of you have a, a powerful life testimony. But I, I really felt I wanted to challenge you with the sixth point. Is the way you follow Jesus something your prodigal would want? Would they be saying, like Dakota did, God, if you are real, let me feel you like my mom and my dad? Or would they pray, I want to know you like my mom and my dad? I want what they have too. I'm coming So what can we do? If this is going to be a place where prodigals are going to come home, what can we do? We can pray and we can pray and we can pray and we can believe. We can be careful how we relate to them when they're prodigals. We can let God take them to the bottom, believing that he loves them more than we do and we can trust him. We'll continue to pray until they are either saved and transformed or until we go to be with the Lord. And then we're going to live in a way that our prodigals will want to live the way that we do. And we're going to see them start to come home. Some of your prodigals, they don't live here. They're going to go, they're going to come home someplace else. And I know that you're praying that wherever they come home, let's say they come home in St. Louis, Missouri. If your prodigal comes home in St. Louis, Missouri, don't you want a church that when they finally walk back into the Father's house, the local church, is going to meet them at the door and embrace them. And even if they were like Dakota and they still smell like marijuana, somebody's going to wrap their arms around them or at least be willing to get close enough to give them a good, read, a good um, greeting and to really be glad that they are there and to begin to connect them with other people and to disciple them. Isn't that the kind of church you want your prodigal to go to? Yes? 
then that's the kind of church we need to be because there's other parents praying for kids that are here that are going to come here. Are we going to be that kind of church? Are we going to be that kind of church? Final story about another prodigal who came home. And you're familiar with this prodigal. Though you didn't know he was a prodigal, we just know him as J.C. Penney. And there's a whole chain of uh, department stores named after him. Became a very wealthy man. J.C. Penney was a man who was seriously depressed, especially as a young man. And he tells of being confined in a mental hospital, suffering such severe depression that doctors had given up on him. One morning on hearing a commotion there in the hospital, down the hall is where he heard it. He put on his bathrobe and he walked out and he found his way to the chapel because in the chapel were people singing. They were singing about putting their trust in the Lord. Now, Penny was the son of a Baptist preacher. Penny grew up in a Baptist preacher's home. Penny grew up knowing about the ways of Jesus. For whatever reason, J.C. Penny ended up in a very severe, depressed state in a mental hospital. But that day, in the chapel, because he knew all about Jesus, he decided once again to trust him. And from that moment on, his entire life changed. And from that point until he died at the age of 95, the Lord was the center of his life. J.C. Penney came back to the father's house. I'm certain his preacher father and his mother were praying for him as well as the church and other family members. But the prodigal came home. The prodigal came home. I started the message saying this as the team comes to the platform. What will the stories be when our prodigals come home? What story will you call and tell me? Pastor Rick, my son, my daughter. You talked about being in St. Louis. Well, they were in Oregon or Nashville, Tennessee. But they went to a church. They were raised in this church or they were raised in another church. And you start telling the stories or the people that come here. Some of you... Your prodigals actually live in this area. Can we believe for them to walk through the doors of this church? Can we believe for them to walk through the doors of this church and to commit their lives to Jesus? What stories will be our stories? You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.